Well, like I said at the start, our passage today is Colossians 2, 6 and 7. You can follow along in your Bibles at home on the screen or in the outlines you printed if you did so. You'll notice there that the Bible reading is structured along the logic of the passage and that will prove helpful later on as we spend time unpacking it. Therefore, as you have received Christ Jesus the Lord, walk in him, rooted and built up in him, and established in the faith just as you were taught, and overflowing with thankfulness. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. There's an outline there on your screens or in your service booklets if you printed it off. A box down the bottom of the screen to send us any questions, feedback or queries. We'll endeavour to get back to you as soon as we can. I want to begin by setting out what we're going to be doing over the next three weeks. Colossians 2, 6 to 23 is really one large section. The whole section deals with doubts that might have arisen amongst the Christians in Colossae based on the fine sounding or persuasive arguments that have been presented to them, doubts about whether Jesus is enough. The argument is clear. The content typical with Paul is pretty dense. Colossians 2, 6 and 7, the passage we're looking at today, is the key principle of the letter and especially of this section. Uh, Paul sets that out first, reminding the Colossians of who they are and how that affects their behaviour. And then in verses 8 to 15, 16 to 23, he deals with the doubts that have been raised about the sufficiency of the Lordship of Jesus. Now, on the one hand, he sets out the facts about the identity that the Colossian Christians have in Jesus in verses 8 to 15. It undermines any doubt they might have had about what they've received from the Lordship of Jesus. Now, on the other hand, in verses 16 to 23, he deals with all the attempts people uh, aim to achieve something deficient in the sufficiency of Jesus, everything that people do to deal with their doubts. The whole section is dealing with the doubts about the sufficiency of Jesus as Lord. Today I want to deal with just verses 6 to 7. I want to deal with them as a key principle, not just of this section, but of the letter as a whole. And I want to use this key principle to encourage us to think more deeply about our identity and our behaviour. Let me pray. Father, thanks for your word. Thank you that we can read it. Father, please apply it to us by your spirit so that we walk in the truth that Christ Jesus is Lord. Amen. Well, that point one on the outline of identity and behaviour, I wonder if you've ever spent much time thinking about who you are and how that affects what you do. I don't mean at this point any kind of deep and metaphysical pondering. I mean, at just a very basic level, I would think about me. Uh, I'm a male, therefore I. Uh, I'm a husband, therefore I. Uh, I'm a father, therefore I. And I'm an Australian, therefore I. You could play that game at home. You see, whether we like it or not, there is an inevitable connection between who we are and what we do. Our identity is the foundation for our behaviour. Who we are sets up what we do. Now, most of that comes naturally to us. We seem to have a bit of a grasp about what it means to be a father and off we toddle. But I wonder if we think more deeply ever about our identity as Christians, as people who live in the kingdom of God's Son. You see, when I say I'm a Christian, therefore I, What immediately springs to your mind? What ideas are raised? In in fact, when was the last time you and I sat down and thought hard about that, deeply about what it meant for me to be identified as a Christian? That identity, Christian, is not just limited to one field of behaviour. It influences all of my behaviour. I am a Christian is an identity That changes every other identity label that I wear. Put it another way, if I've changed my postcode, well, I've changed my behaviour. If I've been transferred, then I am transformed. Paul's now finished the introduction to his letter and he's laid out the foundation. I'm at point two on the outline. And now he turns to his major concern. Therefore, as you've received Christ Jesus the Lord, walk in him. 
rooted and built up in him, established in the faith, just as you were taught, overflowing with thankfulness. Therefore should cast our mind back over everything that Paul has said. At the heart of everything he said is the good news that Jesus Christ is Lord of all things. Jesus is able. That truth is radically transferred and transformed those who've become Christians in Colossae. They've moved from the domain of darkness into the kingdom of God's Son. They've accepted that Jesus is our Lord, boss, because he bought us peace with God by dying for our sins. That, that's the truth at the heart of the Lordship of Jesus. That's what it means to be a Christian. Jesus is our Lord. He's bought us peace with God. That's Paul's message. That's at the heart of the identity of the Christians in Colossae. It's the heart of Paul's prayer and concern for them. But therefore must also turn our minds back to the immediate context, verses 4 and 5 of Colossians chapter 2. Paul's got a concern. He doesn't want his fellow believers in Colossae, even though he's never met them, to be deceived by persuasive arguments. This now becomes Paul's focus because though he's absent physically, his deep contention spiritually, his deep desire spiritually is for the lives of these believers that they remain with Jesus Christ as Lord. He wants to strengthen them as they face persuasive arguments. And so he turns to these issues now for the rest of the letter. At point three on the outline, uh, listen again to Paul's key response to these persuasive arguments, verses six and seven. Therefore, as you have received Christ Jesus the Lord, walk in him, rooted and built up in him, established in the faith, just as you were taught, overflowing with thankfulness. Paul begins his exhortation to these readers with an affirmation of their identity. And then he looks at the behavior that emerges from it. His key principle is to remind them of who they are so that they understand what they are to do. That's typical of Paul. In fact, every one of Paul's pastoral letters works with this kind of structure. Remember Ephesians last year? He sets out the identity of his readers, an identity found in God's work through the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus for them. And then he looks at what that means for their behavior. If you like technical terms with lots of syllables, it's the indicative and the imperative. Literally, who you are and what you do. He does the same here in two verses, but it mirrors the structure of the letter as a whole. And the first two chapters largely deal with their identity, and the second two chapters deal with their lives. The identity of the Christians in Colossae is there in verse 6. They've received Christ Jesus as Lord. I mean, be careful at this point that we don't assume that Paul means the same thing we do when we say that phrase, have you Jesus Christ as your Lord? When Paul uses the term received, he's actually using a term that's got a technical meaning in his writing. You can see it in 1 Corinthians 15 verses 1 and 3, and we'll see it a little later in this service in 1 Corinthians 11, 23. Uh, he's using a term to describe the transfer of a block of knowledge from one person to another the transfer of a block of knowledge from one person to another. The Colossians were given the message that Christ Jesus is the Lord. That's the message behind the phrase, the faith, a little further on. That's the truth that's been handed down and passed along and received. And when they've received that truth, they've understood that Jesus is Lord of all things. He's able, Colossians 1, 15 to 20, as Neil helped us understand. They've understood that Jesus' lordship has its fullest expression at a place called the cross where he won peace for sinful humans with God. Jesus' lordship is established in winning forgiveness for sinners, buying them out of the rule of Satan. Jesus' lordship is the truthful expression of God's generous grace, chapter 1, verse 6. Jesus' lordship brings a future hope that no human can ever hope to buy or attain or earn on their own, Colossians 1 verse 5. And when you think about that and you unpack it a little, that's some evangelistic message, isn't it? That's a message that was given to Epaphras who received it and what he took to Colossae and taught them, they learned it from him and received it. It's a body of teaching, the truth, the faith. And they've put their trust in this. 
this truth that Jesus Christ is Lord. They've received it and they've received it personally. They've learned it and it's changed them. And so their identity is intertwined with that truth. It's caught up in that truth. Jesus Christ is Lord. Well, what, what does that mean? When you trawl back through the opening chapter and a half, you begin to realize that the lordship of Jesus lays out a pretty significant identity for these people, for all Christians. They're the recipients of God's grace. God's given them his mercy at the very moment they deserved his judgment, chapter 1, verse 6. They've received an inheritance that is eternal life in the presence of God, chapter 1, 5 and 12. They've changed their eternal postcode from the domain of darkness to the kingdom of God's Son, chapter 1, verse 13. They've been redeemed, bought at a significant and costly price at someone else's expense, given freedom at a huge cost, chapter 1, 14. They've had their sins forgiven, chapter 1, 14, which means that by the life, death and resurrection of this man Jesus, they now have peace with God, chapter 1, verse 20. They've been moved from being the hostile enemies of God to being reconciled to God, chapter 1, 21 to 22. They've moved from being alienated from God to be in the presence of God, being able to be presented to God as blemish, without blemish and perfect, chapter 1, 21 to 22. They have all the knowledge, all the wisdom to deal with life appropriately because Jesus Christ is their Lord. He lives in them and with them, chapter 2, verse 3. It's a pretty significant identity, isn't it? And that identity leads to very clear action. That point four on the outline, look at verse six. It's in bold and underlined, walk in him. Therefore, you've received Christ Jesus the Lord, walk in him. Now, the image of walking is one of Paul's favorite images to describe life. It's right throughout Ephesians. It's already here in Colossians chapter one, verse 10. Uh, it's an appropriate image because the way a person walks tells us a lot about them. In fact, our walk is part of our identity. We all have a unique walk and, and the way we walk reveals who we are. Think of a shearer, think of a soldier, think of a, a jockey or a stockman who spend their days on horses. An NRL player, how we walk is unique. It reveals who we are. It's no surprise then that Paul has picked it as one of his favourite images for life. So Christians, God's people, uh, residents in the kingdom of the Son of God should walk showing Jesus is their boss. Their walk reveals their identity, where it is placed in him. The lordship of Jesus dictates their lives so much that their walk in him should almost be indistinguishable from his walk. Now, in case we miss the significance and meaning of this, you'll notice there on the outline that Paul unpacks what this means in four terms. The terms themselves are interesting. Uh, rooted is the only one in the past. It's in the perfect tense. All the others are in the present tense. Uh, the first three terms, rooted, built up and established, are all in the passive voice. They're things done to people by God. It's only the last one, overflowing with thankfulness, that is something we do towards God. Uh, the terms are, are terms that speak of inevitable growth as people, as Christians, as citizens. There's no one stagnant. We could go on. Now, as we begin to look at these terms, I want us to notice that the walking is inseparable from the identity that Christians have. The walk is in him. The roots and building up are in him. The growth in the Christian life is in the faith as you were taught. The whole growth and life of the Christian can be summed up as being in him, as being with Jesus as Lord. In fact, can you see how this encompasses everything? There is no compartmentalization of life as a Christian. The whole walk is in him. He is Lord of it all. The identity as a Christian is the identity that Jesus Christ is Lord. That's overall, from what you read to what you think, from how you conduct your job to what you say at home, from how you parent to how you organize your finances, from what you desire to what you want to avoid, from who you know to what you do, it is all in him. Now, now to those terms, rooted and built up in him. I'm no green thumb, but one of the great truths that even I understand is in gardening, the soil is crucial to fueling the plant. And once you've planted something in the right soil and it's flourishing, you're an idiot to move it. 
The starting point of the Christian life is the soil for the rest of the Christian life. Jesus Christ is Lord. You see, that's where the identity of the Christian begins. It's what moves them from being an enemy of God to a child of God. The, the planning is by God. It's an established fact. It's something that's been done to people by God. In that soil, the lordship of Jesus, these plants began and are to grow. And again, God himself has established the means sorry, which that will be, through which that will be. In this case, it's the truths about Jesus as Lord that have been taught. Established in the faith as you were taught. <coughs> Excuse me. The great truth has been revealed to the Colossians. The faith is that we can have peace with God through Jesus Christ as Lord. And that's worth thinking about, isn't it? That truth's been handed to us, the Lordship of Jesus. That truth has been handed to us as something that we can study and delve into, meditate upon, marinate in, consider for the rest of our lives. Uh, if we are to be familiar with the Lordship of Jesus so that we can walk in the Lordship of Jesus in every area of our lives, then we, we, we must know that unpacking this will touch all sorts of things. Now let me ask you some questions. What does it mean for Jesus to be Christ? What does it mean for him to have the fullness of God in him? What does it mean for him to be the firstborn over all creation? What does it mean for him to die, for his blood to be spilled? What does the will of God look like? What does the church look like? What, what is the church? You see, when you unpack Jesus Christ is Lord, you start to meander into every part of life. That's not surprising given Colossians 2 verse 3. That's the faith. To be established in it so that we can walk in it means we must know it. And we must notice here that Paul is not writing, Paul and Timothy are not writing to the vicar who's been to theological college for three to four years or the post-grad student or the university graduate or the theologian or the academic. He's writing to a semi-rural town which had built its reputation on fine wool production, which had started to move into decline. He's writing to a town with no university, with no tertiary education as we know it today. He's writing to men and women who work the land and work in the middle class. He's writing to farmers and wool brokers and spinners and weavers. He's writing to mums and dads and children and grandparents and teenagers and young adults, to singles and to marrieds. That's who he's writing to about this faith that they're to delve into. Does it sound familiar? Overflowing with thankfulness. Here's the response to delving into these depths. The response for sending roots further down, for having our lives built up. It's gratitude and thankfulness. You see, because Jesus is Lord, because I've been transferred into his kingdom and changed my postcode, the walk may be tough, but the identity doesn't change. It's immovable. It's done by God to us. It can't be rusted away. It can't be ground down. It can't be removed under high pressure. It can't be magically disappeared. It's been granted by grace. It's been established by God's strength. It can never be adjusted, damaged, or removed by the world. Now, the walk may feel like it's through molasses uphill into a strong wind, but the identity doesn't change. The lordship of Jesus never disappears. Paul's about to start dealing with the dangers that the Colossian Christians face. I'm at point five on the outline. The false teaching that casts doubts over the sufficiency of the Lordship of Jesus. Before he does, he wants to ram home this key principle, you've received Jesus Christ as Lord, walk in it. The Lordship of Jesus is sufficient. Walk like Jesus is Lord is enough. He makes clear what all of us do unconsciously, our identity is the foundation for our behavior, but he wants to unpack it for us. It's a spur to us to think about who we are and its place in forming and creating our behavior, our identity and behavior. Now, let me close by drawing out five questions. Do you know that the Lordship of Jesus is the foundation for who you are and not the reverse? That's the essence of grace. Jesus Christ came, lived, died on the cross, beat sin and death and the devil, rose again, is established as Lord so that we can be his people. He did not do this 
because we deserved it. He did not do this because we demanded it or requested it. He did not do this because we warranted it by our goodness. He did this despite the fact that we were living in the domain of darkness, alienated from God, enemies in our minds and behavior, hostile. At that moment, the Lordship of Jesus is established by his grace and mercy and not our behavior. Do you know, secondly, that in receiving the Lordship of Jesus, you've submitted every part of your life to him? Jesus will not be compartmentalized to a Sunday. He won't be limited to certain activities or fit within a certain time frame. He won't accept half-heartedness in the walk. He's not the Lord that fits around your job, nor is he the Lord that rules over part of your money. He's not the Lord who has a hands-off approach to the habits and hobbies you find dear, nor is he the Lord that you become more efficient with fitting him around your more important activities. Jesus is Lord of the whole walk. He dictates your finances, the loans you apply for and how you apply for them. He rules over your work choices and your work choices don't rule over him. His lordship instills grace in the way you parent so that your little ones meet him as Lord every day. His lordship decides your leisure activities, your books, your movies, your music, your thoughts, your desires. His lordship sets your life, moulds your whole walk. His lordship is our identity. Thirdly, do you know that the lordship of Jesus is a thing of great depth and wonder? It's a thing to be marvelled at, the fullness of God in flesh, the firstborn from among the dead, the firstborn over all creation, the one who holds all things together, the reason for the universe. It's a thing to be marvelled at, plumbed and studied so that we can understand it more deeply. That's Paul's prayer in chapter 1, verses 9 and 10 and following. How can we apply the whole counsel of God, the lordship of Jesus, if we don't read it and ponder it, meditate upon it, apply it? How can we walk worthily of our Lord if we spend no time understanding his lordship and revealed will? How will we be established in the faith as we're taught if all the teaching we get is a convenient 20-minute message on a Sunday? Here's a call to read and read and read and listen and listen and listen and pray and pray and pray. Ponder and think upon the Lordship of Jesus. Fourthly, do you know that the Lordship of Jesus is enough? There's a complete sufficiency about the Lordship of Jesus for his people. There's no need for anything more or anything less. It's not deficient when it comes to dealing with your nature, your life, the realities you face every day. It's not deficient in helping you parent, in guiding education, in encouraging wise employment decisions, in helping to monitor the things we imbibe and absorb and how we retire. The Lordship of Jesus does not lack for marriage and singleness, for employment and humanity, for leisure, for old age, for young age, for adolescence, for being teenagers and young adults. There is no more you need for life. So don't stray from the Lordship of Jesus. To stray from the Lordship of Jesus is to, just, is to stray into deficient existence. Do you know that the Lordship, finally, of Jesus is a fount of great thankfulness? You see, without that Lordship, my postcode is in the domain of darkness. I am alienated from God. I am at war with God. My sins remain piled up and unforgiven. I have no life. I do not know God. You see, without the Lordship of Jesus, my town has no hope. My friends have no hope. My family has no hope. You see, without the Lordship of Jesus, my identity is battered by the world, moulded by the devil at the whim of public opinion, the latest trends, and able to be duped by persuasive words. The Lordship of Jesus has restored me to God, has dealt with my sin, has bought my peace by his blood, has moved my home postcode from hell to heaven, has allowed me to come into the throne room of God, 
I have everything I need because Jesus is Lord. Thanks be to God for the Lordship of Jesus. Let me pray. Dear God, thank you that Jesus is Lord. Thank you that by him I move from hell to heaven, from enemy to friend, from alienated to reconciled, from darkness to light, from death to life. Father, thank you that this comes at the expense of his life, death, and resurrection, which establishes his lordship. Please help me never to stray from the lordship of Jesus. Please help my heart and life to overflow with thankfulness. Please help my walk to reflect my identity. Amen.